Hello and welcome to this lecture in the course for Secure Systems Engineering. In the previous uh, video lectures, we had actually looked at uh, hardware trojans. Uh, we had looked at two mechanisms uh, to detect hardware trojans. The first was called FANCY, uh, which detected hardware trojans present in IP cores. Uh, the second was uh, using side channels uh, such as the power consumption of a device uh, to identify uh, the presence of a hardware trojan in a fabricated IC. Now uh, as we mentioned in the previous video, all of these techniques though successful uh, to a certain extent uh, are very easily evaded by trojan developers. Uh, essentially we could write uh, hardware trojans. Uh, that specifically could, could bypass all of these uh, techniques uh, that have been developed to detect hardware trojans. An alternate approach to solve this particular problem is to prevent hardware trojans altogether. So essentially, if we cannot detect the presence of a hardware trojan, we will uh, design circuits in such a way so that uh, insertion of hardware trojans in the circuits becomes difficult. In this lecture, we'll be looking at this paper called uh, Silencing Hardware Backdoors. This paper was actually presented in Oakland 2011 and uh, a lot of the slides that we will be presenting today uh, in this video lecture is by Adam Wakesman's uh, Oakland talk in 2011, uh, essentially the talk corresponding to this specific paper. Now a lot of the paper is based on the fact that the hardware trojan comprises of two components. The first component is known as a trigger and the second component as we have seen in the previous lectures is the payload. If somehow we can design our hardware module such that it is difficult to create such a trigger then payload would never execute. Even though a hardware trojan may be present uh, if the trigger never happens as expected by the attacker then uh, the payload will never execute and a sensitive information or uh, malicious activities uh, by the device uh, would never occur. So uh, the critical aspect in what this paper talks about is how would we make triggering the hardware trojan difficult. Essential idea in this entire thing is a way to hide the triggers so that the payloads never execute. Our base idea is to enumerate the different ways uh, triggers can appear in a hardware design and try to make it difficult uh, for an attacker to actually design trojans with these variety of triggers. To understand this, we take a high level picture of uh, a hardware module and what we see is that every hardware module comprises of uh, some inputs and provided, provides some outputs. These inputs can be categorized as global inputs uh, such as uh, the clock, reset signal and so on. Uh, control inputs which modify the state machine of uh, the hardware module, uh, data inputs for example data read from memory and so on and uh, each of these will affect the outputs of uh, the particular triggers and each of these will affect uh, the outputs of this particular module. Each of these uh, inputs global control data and test could potentially be a way through which uh, a, a trigger can be activated. So in this particular work we focus mainly on uh, the triggers that could come through the gl global signals, the control signals and the data signals. So each of these uh, different signals global control and data would uh, have different types of triggers. So we call uh, the triggers based on the global signals such as a clock as a ticking time bomb. Control signals uh, could be uh, cheat codes which uh, are single shot or uh, in a sequence or data signals could again be cheat codes in a single shot or sequence. So what we will see in this particular video lecture is how each of these triggers will look and how we can design our hardware modules so as to prevent uh, these triggers or make it difficult for an attacker to build hardware trojans with these mechanisms. So let's start with trigger ticking time bombs. Essentially if we consider this as our, our hardware uh, module, what a ticking time bomb trigger does is that it waits for a fixed time and then triggers uh, the hardware trojans payload to execute. 
This time is uh, typically specified by the attacker. The attacker may want that the Trojan's trigger gets activated may say after uh, a few months, a few weeks or maybe even a few years or uh, maybe at a specific time during the year. So, if we look at this more in detail about how a ticking time bomb's uh, trigger would be designed, uh, the design would look something like this. Uh, so, there would be an input uh, to the device over here. So, this input could be either uh, say data or anything else which is specified by the user. Uh, there, uh, this would go through an origin uh, to through the standard logic uh, which is supported uh, by the hardware device uh, and uh, uh, then uh, the output goes. The hardware trojan in such a scenario would look something like this. Uh, we would have a counter over here which possibly gets incremented at every clock pulse and furthermore uh, this counter is compared with the triggered value. For example, let us say that the attacker has designed the hardware trigger so that uh, it gets activated after a year. So, this means that at regular intervals as the counter is incremented, uh, the comparator uh, would uh, check the number of clock cycles that elapsed or the number of amount of time that elapsed and typically would gi give a value of 0 after the right amount of period has elapsed, uh, the comparator would provide an output of 1. Side by side, there is a malicious logic which uh, performs, for example, uh, leaks the secret input through a multiplexer. So, in the general operation, uh, the comparator would uh, give an output of 0, which would mean that the original logic's uh, result is sent to the output. On the other hand, when the right amount of time has elapsed, the comparator would give you an output of 1, uh, which causes the multiplexer to switch uh, the output uh, from that of the malicious logic. Therefore, uh, when the comparator provides an output of 1, that is after the uh, specified time has elapsed, then uh, the payload corresponding to this malicious logic gets executed and uh, secret or sensitive data is leaked to the output. Now, in order to silence a ticking time bomb, what we first assume is something known as an epoch duration. Now, this duration could be anywhere say from one week, uh, a few days or even a month and what we assume here is that this during this epoch period, we have extensively tested uh, the entire design so that no hardware trojans get triggered uh, within this uh, particular epoch period. Now, beyond this uh, epoch period, uh, we are not certain whether a hardware trojan may get triggered or not. So, in order to silence this uh, ticking time bomb, what we do is that uh, at periodic intervals of time, at periods equal to that of an epoch, we reset uh, the entire circuit. That is, we uh, reset the power of the circuit. So, uh, by doing so, what would happen? is that the counter which is counting the time elapsed and is part of the uh, hardware trojan would also get reset. So, therefore, the maximum uh, count that is permissible by this counter is up to the epoch. Now, since we are resetting the power at the end of the epoch, the counter would reset and start counting again to 0. Now, based on our assumption and uh, the extensive testing that there are no hardware trojans that can be triggered with a time less than an epoch, resetting this uh, circuit would prevent any trojan from being triggered. However, resetting the circuit in the middle of its operation has its own hurdles. So, resetting would imply that uh, we would need to flush the pipeline, we need to save the current state of the entire system, uh, so that when the uh, power is turned on again, the uh, hardware device can actually continue to execute from where it had uh, stopped. The various components within the hardware such as registers, uh, branch history targets and so on would require to be saved. Now, what we will now discuss is uh, whether there is a way to bypass uh, such a uh, protection mechanism. Is there a way an attacker could still trigger a Trojan's payload at a time which is even greater than an epoch even with the uh, resets that are present. So, one thing that the attacker could do is that uh, 
periodically the attacker could actually store the counter in a memory location. So, this memory location we can assume is um, non volatile and what we could actually do is that when the uh, power is restarted the first thing the uh, counter would do is to restart from the stored value. This way uh, potentially the attacker could uh, cause the counter to count two values which is greater than the epoch time. So, uh, in order to do this uh, what the attacker would need is that some amount of uh, non volatile memory or flash memory to be present within uh, the IC. So, the attacker could for example, add a few uh, cells of uh, flash uh, within the hardware design and use this uh, malicious flash to store uh, the intermediate counter values. One thing that can be done to actually prevent this is to repeatedly turn uh, the device on and off. For example, this can be done by say connecting the clock source uh, to the power source. Therefore, the device is continuously and very at a very high rate turned on and off. And what would happen if there are flash uh, memories present is that the flash memories would get destroyed. Thus, even if the attacker decides to add flash and store the intermediate counters in this non volatile memory, uh, the uh, flash would get destroyed by this repeated turning on and turning off the device. Another potential way to bypass uh, this uh, protection mechanisms for a ticking time bomb is to write uh, this intermediate value of the counter into some memory location in the RAM for instance. And uh, after the reset uh, assuming that the RAM value has not decayed. However, aspects such as unmaskable interrupts could actually make uh, designing such a mechanism quite difficult. So, in order uh, as we know unmaskable interrupts cannot be blocked and if an unmaskable interrupt occurs uh, during uh, the time when the uh, device is turned off or when the power reset is being done, then uh, that uh, interrupt would get lost. In order to prevent this, what needs to be done is uh, a FIFO can be used which would temporarily store the unmaskable interrupts uh, during this power reset time. Uh, other aspects which may uh, make things difficult is the performance counters which may also be a source of uh, time bombs. Another way to trigger uh, Trojans is by something known as cheat codes. So, with a cheat code the uh, specific input for example, cafe beef uh, when uh, given to the trigger circuit would activate uh, the trigger circuit which in turn would then activate the payload of the hardware Trojan. Now, we have seen examples of this in the previous videos. We had seen how uh, when a specific address is uh, present in the input. Uh, this specific address would then set a trigger value to 1, which would then uh, switch a multiplexer to leak sensitive data to the output. A typical cheat code type of hardware Trojan would look something like this. Uh, we have a uh, input over here and the attacker specific uh, cheat code is stored uh, over here. So, for each input that uh, comes there is a comparison done between the cheat code stored and uh, an output of 0 or 1 is then uh, obtained. So, for inputs which are not equal to that of the cheat code uh, the multiplexer would choose the original logic uh, as the output and the results would work as normal. And when the uh, input is equal to that of the cheat code uh, the multiplexer would then uh, switch to the malicious logic and then the secret uh, information get can get leaked out. So, uh, how would one actually prevent hardware trojans from being activated with cheat codes? So, one way uh, is to make sure that the cheat code set by the attacker is never obtained as per his wishes. So, for example, if we have an encryptor module over here, uh, any input uh, which is given first gets en encrypted or in other words gets obfuscated to some other value then the hardware module works on this encrypted data and then there is a decrypted uh, module and uh, obtain a current correct output. So, a uh, note first that since for every encryptor there is also a decryptor at the output uh, the results should always be correct. And secondly also note that uh, this obfuscation of the inputs would prevent the cheat code from activating the trigger. For example, if the cheat code is say cafe uh, beef 
uh, we have cafe beef uh, stored over here. Now what the attacker would expect is that when he gives an input equal to cafe beef, uh, it would change the comparator's output to 1 and forcing the malicious logic to be activated and uh, change the output results. Now what we have done is we have in introduced an encryptor uh, over here which essentially obfuscates the input and cafe beef when supplied as an input gets actually mapped to some other totally different value and uh, therefore will not match the uh, cheat code which is stored and uh, therefore the attacker will not be able to control uh, this multiplexer as per the wishes. So one ideal way to build such data obfuscation is uh, by a technique known as homomorphic encryption. Uh, this uh, technique was actually uh, proposed by Craig Gentry in 2009. Uh, so here what happens is that uh, the memory controller is assumed to be able to work uh, on encrypted data, provide inputs for example uh, S5 and 7, uh, it gets encrypted using the homomorphic encryption and then the memory controller will be able to function on this encrypted data and then uh, provide its result. The decryptor would then be able to decrypt and get the correct values for uh, the inputs. However, a homomorphic encryption uh, is quite uh, difficult to achieve in practice especially for uh, this kind of uh, uses and uh, therefore we would require alternate options. So uh, what was proposed in the paper was to actually divide the type of operations into non-computational and computational. So hardware components such as routers, interconnects, memory, cache memories, buffers, registers and so on are non-computational hardware entities. So these are non-computational because it does these do not actually modify the data but rather uh, they just either store the data or just route the data to specific locations or um, uh, just provide a lookup or so on. So providing data obfuscation uh, with such non-computational uh, hardware units is quite easy. All that is required is just an XOR uh, at the input uh, with some secret uh, data. So this uh, XOR would then map a specific input to something which is totally different and uh, similarly anything which is stored over here uh, that same secret is XORed back uh, to obtain the, co the corresponding output. So for example if we have this memory controller uh, what we could possibly do is uh, if your input is 5 you XOR it with a certain uh, specific key and uh, obtain uh, a value of 8. So uh, similarly by XORing again the output uh, 8 uh, with that same key you obtain 5. In a similar way uh, by taking uh, the input 7, encrypting it uh, with a specific key and obtaining 4 uh, and at the other end uh, when we have 4 we uh, decrypt it with the same key to obtain back the 7. So this would uh, prevent the triggers. Now let us say that if in this memory controller there is a hardware trojan which is based on this cheat code and let us assume that the cheat code has a value of let us say 5. Now when the attacker sends a value of 5 hoping that uh, the uh, trigger would get activated uh, it will not in this case because in fact the value of 5 is getting encrypted uh, to 8 and therefore will not actually activate the trigger. Now achieving data obfuscation for the computational case is far more difficult. Now if we have a module which actually computes uh, something for example it could be ALUs, FPUs, decoders or any other custom logic, uh, it is actually very difficult to obfuscate uh, these things and this has to be done on a case to case basis. For example if there is an ALU and within the ALU there is let us say an, a multiplier, now we would require to obfuscate the inputs to the multiplier and remove the obfuscation uh, at the after the end so that the original results are obtained. So uh, this is not very easy and has to be done on a case to case basis. Another way uh, triggers uh, can be built is by uh, sequence cheat codes. For example, if a particular sequence such as C, A, F, E, B, E, E, F is obtained uh, in a specific sequence, uh, only then uh, this particular trojan if it is present in uh, this hardware unit it would get activated. 
So we had seen examples uh, of uh, this sequence cheat code in, in the first lecture on hardware trojans and uh, we had seen how uh, a state machine would be maintained by the hardware trojan to uh, identify transitions whenever uh, these specific inputs are obtained and eventually move uh, the trigger from a 0 to a 1 and thereby forcing the uh, payload to be activated and secret information leaked out. So, one way by which we can break this uh, sequence based uh, cheat codes uh, is by reordering. Uh, assuming that uh, there is no dependency between these various inputs and any input can, uh, can independently come at any time. If we break these uh, inputs for example, if the inputs were provided in A, B and C order, we just reorder the inputs uh, like this uh, into A, C and B and uh, feed it here and we uh, reorder the results back after the uh, computation is done. So, uh, why would this uh, thing work? Uh, let us say that the attacker uh, has kept a sequence cheat code as A, a B and C. Now, the attacker is sending A, B and C as the input and he is hoping, to, uh, hoping that this sequence of cheat codes would trigger the hardware trojan and uh, thereby the payload. So, internally this trigger will occur uh, by the state machine which moves uh, due to A then to B and then finally to C and uh, moving to in this sequence would then uh, cause the trigger to be activated. Now, since we have reordered uh, these inputs from A, B, C to A, C, B, uh, this state machine will never reach its final state and therefore, the trigger will never get activated and therefore, the payload will uh, be non-functional. Another way to handle this uh, sequence cheat codes is by arbitrarily inserting some random inputs. So, for example, over here given the input is A, B and C and the attacker is actually waiting specifically for A to occur then B and then finally C in consecutive cycles. Inserting a random uh, input D would actually break this uh, sequence and thereby uh, prevent the hardware trojan from being activated. So, designing uh, circuits or systems uh, keeping in mind these hardware trojans uh, and the way uh, a trojan's triggers can be designed could drastically reduce the, uh, the cases where uh, trojans can be activated in a particular hardware module. However, as we have seen uh, there are many uh, cases or many circuits where making such designs is uh, incredibly difficult to do. Uh, in such cases uh, the worst case situation is where we could actually have two units possibly uh, designed uh, independently and both in and inputs are sent to both of these units and uh, verified at the output. So, for example, we have a very complicated uh, circuit over here let us say for example, a cryptographic algorithm uh, and uh, we want to ensure that this cryptographic algorithm does not have any trojans. What we could do is we could design completely independently an other unit uh, A prime and possibly just fabricated this unit uh, in a totally uh, different environment and feed the same inputs to both these units. So, both these units perform exactly the same functionality and if there is no trojan that is present would give the same output. Now, if for example, we, we provide a specific uh, input, a specific time uh, or uh, a specific cheat code which triggers, uh, triggers a functionality in one of these units then uh, the results would be different uh, between unit A and unit A prime and uh, as a result uh, this checker over here would identify the difference and then stop the execution from occurring. Thank you.